Kathmandu, February 27th. It seems a simple idea to go to Mount Everest with a small group of enthusiastic skiers and climbers, but it is not simple. I wonder if I would have dared to think of this adventure if I had known how complex it would be. There are 27 tons of luggage. We will need 800 porters to carry it all. The ski team needs supporting mountaineers. There are scientific research teams, a film crew, photographers and pressmen. March 6th, the trail from Kathmandu to the foot of Everest winds for 185 miles through the valleys and foothills of the Himalayas. These Himalayan expeditions are possible only because of the barefooted tribesmen who were born to walk, 
and walk to live. I feel their many spirits carry me along. In the ancient days of the gods, we invited the sun and the moon and the stars to join us in singing and living. But those days have gone. We have wandered from the paths of the winds and become children of the earth. Now is the time to open up our world, to find the sun, moon and stars again. To men of the east, Mount Everest has been the mother goddess of the world, Chomo Lungma. To men of the West, the mountain has presented a challenge to reach the summit. I go as a pilgrim, inspired by the majesty of Chomo Lungma, to ski down the highest mountain in the world. On the first part of the journey, we follow the path that has been used for centuries by trade caravans, traveling on foot from Kathmandu across the high passes to Tibet. There is nothing to do but walk and think. My mind floats from one incomplete memory to another. I think of my own son, Yuta, I wonder how he is. What would he think if he were old enough to understand the life of adventure I have chosen to escape from the labyrinth of the cities? I've never felt so tired. I'm no longer 20, I'm 37 years old. But it's too late to think of that now. Each time I think we have left civilization behind, we come upon a village clinging to a hillside. When I read the stories of the world's great wanderers, my imagination soars. Skiing is my doorway to adventure. I am Tom Sawyer in the snow, or the little prince in a mountain world. I remember the race in Italy where I set the world speed record. I took a bad fall near the end of the run. I got some bruises, but I was lucky. The Italian announcer seemed amazed that I had survived. Mura is alive, he kept shouting. Mura is alive. 
I was a hero that day. Then there was Fuji. It seemed a heroic idea to shush down the sacred mountain of Japan, an exploit that would capture the imagination of the world. But it was not so daring after all. It seems to me that greater than the satisfaction of winning in competition is the joy of forgetting yourself and becoming one with the mountains. I have traveled the world to ski, to soar with the winds, to laugh with the gods. March 13th, we have been walking seven days. We have reached the gateway to the foothills, Jumbesi Pass, 11,000 feet high, higher than Fuji. At Jumbesi, we encounter snow for the first time. There is some fear that these low altitude porters will go home. Fortunately, on the other side of the ridge, there is little snow. To ski down the sacred mountain, the basic requirement will be endurance. My job on this trip is to be in perfect physical condition. Perhaps the porters think me a bit arrogant, a show-off, doing all these crazy exercises. Someone told them I was a religious fanatic, worshipping my gods with this continual prostration. Perhaps they're right. It is a sort of ritual preparation for the meeting with the mountain. When I stood at the top of Fuji, I knew that the mountains set high the price of victory. Weakness of body or spirit brings defeat. The challenge of the peaks is the challenge of life itself, to struggle higher, forever higher. After 10 days of walking, we stop at the village of Takshindu. When you crawl into your sleeping bag, each cell of your body begins to sing very softly and to expand in joy and warmth, looking at the starlight coming through the crack of the tent, listening to the trickling sound of a creek, falling asleep. Each morning brings us closer to our great adventure. The word adventure sounds a little cheap. It doesn't quite express the spirit of our fathers who wandered the earth. We've lost the words that encourage action, the words of question, laughter, mystery, the words of spirits awaken, and the words of dreams.
The streams we cross now are the melted snows of Everest itself. This seems to be a cold-hearted procession, a 1,600-legged monster that keeps walking, endlessly walking, uphill, downhill, uphill, downhill, and repeat and repeat again. If anyone dropped behind, I am sure the monster would not even look back, just keep on walking. Chomo Luma, Mother Goddess of the World. March 18th. On the 12th day, we reach Namchi Bazaar halfway to Everest. Here the trade caravans branch off to Tibet. This is the main village of the Sherpas, the people of the mountains. Our low-level porters are paid off at the rate of one U.S. dollar a day. Are there men in the Western world who would carry 30 kilos on their backs from Kathmandu through the mountains for a living? I think there would be no Europeans or Japanese who would do it. Under the starlight, a dance begins. The girls are like bright angels in rags. They're a little embarrassed, but they put their arms around us and lead us through the rhythmic waves of the dance. Not quite so graceful when we do it because we have drunk a little too much chan. This local liquor is a very happy drink. In the morning, we set out with about 400 Sherpas. These are the best mountain climbers in the world. Some of them have been on as many as eight Everest expeditions. 
we leave behind a village of women and children. Their men are often in the mountains for weeks at a time. I wonder what will be the future of these tribesmen who have lived here for centuries, almost independent of the rest of the world. I hope their land will remain unspoiled by the ways of life that we call progress. Above the village of Kum Jung, there is a hospital built with money raised in New Zealand by Sir Edmund Hillary, who reached the summit of Everest with Tenzing Norgay in 1953. We visit him and tell him about our dream of skiing down the face of Everest. I've been told by the leader of the American team who also reached the top that it's impossible. Hillary says if he were younger, he'd come with us himself. I only wish I could ski as well, and you will have to conserve your strength for the big effort. He says that challenge is what makes men. When men um, stop looking for challenges, meeting challenges, well, we human beings will be in a very bad way. <laughs> Challenge is what makes men. And there can be no challenge without the risk of failure. As I walk, I feel the earth in all its warmth and beauty. It may be the last time. March 20th, near the Lamasery of Tiang Boche, we stop for five days rest. This has become traditional because every expedition needs time for acclimation in the thin air. Time seems to pass without heeding. It may be a sense of euphoria from lack of oxygen or the beauty of the scenery, but there is no boredom. At night, the mountains become a world of silence beyond imagination. I can see Ama Dablam. A bit steep, but what a downhill run. An old yogi told me that on my pilgrimage, I should breathe out the badness within me and breathe in the goodness of the universe. From this, I learned that breathing begins with exhaling and then comes inhaling. I begin training my lungs for higher altitudes.
this valley seems endless. It is the valley of the Kumbu Glacier, a huge river of ice that flows from the foot of Everest. We are getting closer. March 28th, we have traveled the 185 miles from Kathmandu in 22 days. It will take us 40 days to go the next three miles. Our base camp is on the level area at the foot of Everest used by every expedition from the south. This will be home to 150 people until the day of the great downhill. Tonko, who is in charge of the base camp, is like a magician. He can find anything you need. I have tried to find a diet that would create a superman for the Himalayas, but I didn't find one. I try to eat like the Sherpas. Potatoes and roasted barley are their staple foods. The young men in charge of our supplies spent a few million yen on instant food. I feel sad for the future of young Japanese with that kind of nutrition. The medical research team and the other scientists set up their experiments. They use us as guinea pigs, too. Sometimes this looks like an Apollo moonshot. It is an adventure for machines. They record the action of our hearts and lungs. And no doubt they will pass on useful medical data to other machines all over the world. During the caravan, I was tired. But in my mind, there was always a song. Here, my body has slowed down, and my mind seems to have stopped also. I've dreamed of skiing on the virgin snows of the Himalayas. It's almost like the beginning of love. You can do anything.
The first barrier in the ascent of Everest is a huge ice fall. It looks like the tongue of some gigantic demon. More lives have been lost here than on Everest itself. It rises 1,600 feet, a world of dangerous, fragile beauty. A cascade of massive blocks of ice moving imperceptibly from the glacier above, pushed by the weight of centuries of the snows of Everest. Without warning, it can shift and break into an avalanche of millions of tons of ice. On the other side of this barrier, lies the most challenging ski run in the world. In this strange world, a boy becomes a man. Little Elephant is 15. He has come with the expedition to learn the skills of the mountaineer handed down from father to son for countless generations. He learns from our books, too. And the mountain tells him her own story. The reconnaissance of the ice fall begins. With member Don Amy, okay? We have A group, Kato and Kidem Doje. B group, Yasusta Pembasunda. C group, Otaki and Nobu, who is supported by Don Amy. So, Oshopa, Chopra, have crampons and a boot. Check up today, okay? No boots, no smoke, with overshoes, okay? The most experienced Sherpa and Japanese mountaineers are chosen to find a safe passage through the icefall. It is very important that we move quickly, as we have heard that the monsoon will come early this year.
While a reconnaissance goes on, I work on my equipment. Like an old-fashioned soldier getting ready for battle, my life will depend on it. Every item that I will use higher up must be prepared and checked. I'm going to a glacier called Shangri-La, about two days' walk from here, to make some tests, skiing with a parachute. To mark the speed and direction of the wind, flares are attached to my boots, and a videotape record is made. A parachute could break my speed on icy slopes, but if it is too large, the wind might catch it and pull me off course. I would like to use a parachute. It would add grace and beauty to the adventure, like an airy lotus blossom on the sacred mountain. April the 5th. The reconnaissance party have radioed that they have established a passage through the ice wall. 6 a.m. The mountaineers begin to move up the two tons of equipment and supplies we will need. Forty of the best Sherpa climbers will help our Japanese mountain climbers from here on. The sun's rays, scorching through the thin air, melt the ice. But at night, the temperature drops more than 100 degrees. The ice freezes and expands. Old bridges disappear and new crevices open. Each man carries about 65 pounds on his back. While the porterage goes on, we wait. Cutting okay? 
I guess this is the world's highest videotape audience. The Sherpas have never seen the Seven Samurai. And Little Elephant has never seen Bonanza. Only a roll call will tell who is missing. The ice fall took six lives. But why only Sherpas? There were Japanese in there at the same time. How does the order of destiny apply to people? Little Elephant's father is in the ice fall. That anyone lived was a miracle. About four square miles of ice seemed to have suddenly fallen away, as though the roof of a giant cavern beneath had collapsed and the space was filled with tons of jagged ice. Men lived standing a few feet from others who were crushed.
death should not come suddenly to men who are in the midst of living. It should come gently, as a silent prayer. They had no chance. I feel a hopeless anger. My anger expands into a great nothingness, and sorrow comes like waves of the ocean into which you sink. This morning, we have had a very, very unlucky accident at the height of the 5,700 meters, and uh, we lost six This is one of the worst climbing. accidents in the history of Himalayan climbing. An old uh, hermit had told the Sherpas that an evil star in the east was a bad omen for the expedition. First, uh, Their families want them to go home. I will make a short speech in Japanese. Uh, Mr. Hashima said that men may meet misfortunate acts with saying, Duk Sinko, Uan Awazai, Nuko Awazai, Ro, meaning misfortune will come to fortune. Those six lives were lost in order to achieve a great thing. No one can avoid to meet with death. It was fate. Koreo Seiko Sasur Kotonomiga Tedori de Korekara Novorin Harimas Kanilo Naksamelo Yuchi no Kotode Ah, Mira, who has the same regrets about these sorrowful happenings, says that. Those who died will not be watching over us so that we can succeed. Uh, we must try to compensate the families of the missing Sherpas, and at the same time, we must achieve our goal of skiing down Chomalama. It happened only a few minutes from the South Cold Japanese camp. Chotolai, whose own brother died in the accident, speaks and, to the Sherpas. Uh, on behalf of the climbing leaders of this expression, I have to say this is very, very sorry. We lost such a very, very valuable six Sherpas to such unlucky accident. The mountains are home for us, and a Sherpa will not be a Sherpa if he's afraid of the mountains. So I will continue to climb as long as my Japanese brothers need me. A shadow covers the expedition. How can I justify this adventure now? There can be no happy ending anymore, no matter what I do. The Sherpas believe that the souls of men killed in accidents wander the world as ghosts. We must believe that out of sorrow will come the power to cross over into the light of life. We must use the energy of those six spirits to fight on in order to rest their souls in peace.
The downhill of the spirit is more painful than the uphill of the body. How can the ice fall be so cruel, yet so beautiful? It is like a great crystal pavilion of the goddess, changed by the demon that protects her into an icy tomb. April the 16th. The ice fall is behind us. We have reached the western Coombe, a sloping glacier basin a little more than two miles long. camp has been established near the top of the ice fall, the first camp for the actual ascent of the mountain. There will be five camps on the way up. Camp 2, the advanced base camp, will be near the top of the western Coon. Camp 3, not far from the huge crevasse called the Bergschrund, an unfathomed canyon of ice that cuts across the face of the mountain. We'll have to look for a small ledge on the Lhotse face where we can pitch the tents for Camp 4. At each camp we will stay a few days to get used to the height. Camp 5 will be above the yellow band on the south call, near the start position. The downhill course on the icy wall should end above the Bergschrund. If it doesn't, it's certain death. These mountains are beginning to steal away my identity. They decide how I feel, when I will be hot and when I will be cold, when I can eat and when I cannot eat. They let me breathe or they take my breath away. 
I can't tell where the mountains end and I begin. April the 24th, at Camp 2, above 18,000 feet, the advance party awaits our arrival. The Sherpas call this the evil altitude. Every step seems to rob us of our breath. It is an effort to walk, to talk, even to think. It is almost too much of an effort to live. As we climbed, our bodies have been acclimatized. The chest cavities increase to take in more air. The red blood corpuscles multiply to absorb more of the available oxygen. But here, with less than half the oxygen at sea level, it is beyond human activation. Survival is a matter of sheer endurance. The brain requires 20 times more oxygen than the muscles for normal functioning. And at this altitude, it begins to deteriorate. Intellect and senses are dulled and therefore one can be in danger without realizing it. A long stay would be fatal. My heartbeat and blood pressure are still close to normal. I wonder if I can ski at this height. After two hours, I felt the energy drain from my body as though a switch were turned off. On the last jump, I lost consciousness in midair. In the morning, when we set out for Camp 3, the air is clear, but it clouds up. This weather pattern is a warning that the monsoon is coming. The ice wall of Mount Everest looks like poured silver falling into the western coombe. A cold, cruel beauty. We are face to face with the unknown reality. Is it true that I will ski down there in a few days' time? It is steep, an angle of 40 degrees, 45 in some places. An 8,000 foot wall of ice that doesn't even have a name. There are jutting rocks the size of a four-story building, and at the bottom, the deep, dark void of ice that is the Bergschrund. This is not a world for human beings. At Camp 3, we watch the video recordings of our parachute tests. We must decide which chute to use. 
断面がねそれでこう引きずるのなこれな The tests were made in good snow conditions on Shangri-La, but we must prepare for the icy wall and the thinner atmosphere of Everest. Not even the experts know how a parachute will behave in the thin air. Skydivers and astronauts open their chutes at much lower altitudes than this. From Camp 3 to Camp 4 is a day's climb. I use oxygen for the first time. I could climb without it, but there is the growing fear that lack of oxygen will affect my mind and body. Is a vertical ascent of 3,000 feet. Clinging to this desperate ice wall, there is no room for any mistake. This is not a place that you can change danger into mere difficulty. The fourth camp is like three little birds' nests clinging with stilt legs to an icy cliff. Meditation among these silent peaks empties all the pockets of my mind. As we go higher, only the most precious images remain. I have a strange sense of being close to my family, and yet I feel an almost mystical removal from the world. I think of the Greek myth of Icarus, who fastened wings to his back with wax to escape from a labyrinth where he was a prisoner. In the joy of flight, he soared closer and closer to the sun. Challenging the gods, the sun melted the wax, and Icarus fell to his death in the sea. May fifth, traversing the steep slope above Camp Four, I begin to feel again the pride of the samurai, challenging something huge. Our 27 tons of baggage at Kathmandu has diminished to less than half a ton. The caravan of 800 has dwindled to seven men. We reach the yellow band, 
an almost vertical wall of dangerous, crumbling rock. I follow in the footsteps of the great mountaineers of the past. But I will not walk this path again. Tomorrow, I will take a different road. The South Call at last. This is a very high place, over 26,000 feet. I can see the summit just above, with its royal plume of snow carried by the jet stream, the mighty river of wind that rushes about the world above the atmosphere at 300 miles an hour. This has been called the most desolate spot on earth. Cold, with an eerie, thin wind. It is like the barren, dry bed of the river that separates hell from paradise. It was here that the Swiss turned back in 1952. Here Lambert sensed the odor of death. For me, it is the end of a pilgrimage. I have a strange feeling that I have been here before. Was it an earlier incarnation? I try to write a letter to my daughter to tell her about my dreams and my ambitions, but my mind wanders. There have been many summits, many adventures, but this is different. Something has happened to me. For the first time, I am afraid. I feel lonely and burdened. I worry about failing more than dying. I think of Icarus, who flew too close to the sun. Death would be an easy way out. May 6th, dawn breaks clear and calm. Then, without warning, the wind rises. Its pattern is unpredictable. doesn't drop today, I will have to go back to Camp 3 to get back into condition. And it will take another week to bring up supplies. No one can help me any further. Only my skis will go with me to the end. In a cairn built of rocks, I offer to the mother goddess the names of the dead Sherpas and a mirror, symbol of the soul of man, placed so that the mountain can see her own reflection. It is a gentle ceremony in the face of such violence. Suddenly, the wind begins to abate Eight thousand feet below, the control center gets ready.
Each man of the rescue team takes his position. They read a final checklist to me through a transceiver in my helmet. Is the main chute attached to my waist? Oxygen tank firmly attached. Gym strap passing. There's a safety pin being removed. Transceiver test, can you hear us? The mask and antenna are okay. Rescue boots, binding stock, okay. Checks are completed. It looks skiable. There's no way to know what the wind is like. If it's behind me, the chute may not open. Six seconds from the start, the speed will be over 100 miles an hour. White snow where rocks stick out. Mixed snow and ice down to small rocks. Below that, 90% ice. And the Bergschund. There's no way to pause. Nothing comforting. No escape. seems to be falling over me. Can't hear the wind. No sound. There was a place I was supposed to go. 
I don't know where it is. But I can go there now. Was it a dream? The parachute, slow to open. No sound of wind. A world without sound. Try to break. Diagonal sidestep. Use the edges. Nothing worked. Only shiny ice. Falling into a world without air. But there was no fear. No fear, just nothing. My ski caught something. I felt the ice on my back. Falling. Just falling. The big rock. The back shoot. I am alive. They say I skied 6,600 feet in two minutes and 20 seconds. I fell 1,320 feet. I stopped 250 feet from the crevasse. Numbers have meaning in the world below, but in this almost airless world, what do they mean? Was it a success or a failure? That I am alive must be the will of some higher power. It was like following an order from a different world. Not like being good or bad. Maybe it's love. One thing is the beginning of another. I am a pilgrim again.